I don't know what kind of bondage you may be in. Ruach Elohim means the spirit of the living God. The spirit is here to set us free. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. If there is any form of emotional bondage, why don't you yield to the Lord this morning? Just yield to the Lord this morning. Yes, yes, just close your eyes this morning and talk to God, just talk to him. His spirit is here, his spirit is here, his spirit is here. I feel a constraint, some of you are constrained as if you are being gagged in a position. But the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Allow the Spirit of God to shake you loose of every form of bondage, physical, emotional, spiritual bondage. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I want you to have a release in your spirit, a liberty of the Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. As your hands are lifted, let your heart also be lifted up to him. To receive. We all before him like a maid servant, looking up to the hand of his master. We are saying, Lord, visit us. Lord, visit your people. You know their various situations and circumstances. Visit us this morning. In the name of Jesus. Breathe a word into their hearts. Yes, we have heard the minstrel song. When our heart is overwhelmed, that it will bring a word, we will remember his word. It will take the Holy Spirit to bring the word, to quicken the particular word to you. He's the helper, John 14, 26. The Holy Spirit is the helper. And is the one that brings to remembrance those things that we have been taught. All God has spoken to you, all the great words he has spoken, to take the Holy Spirit to bring them to your remembrance. Father, thank you this morning. Thank you for visiting us already. Be thou exalted. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. And the people of God say... Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm sure you can do better than that. Amen. Glory to God. They read to us Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth became void. It was without form and became void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. But wherever there is darkness, as long as the Spirit of God is there, it will give way to light. Amen. So it doesn't matter what your situation may be. It doesn't matter what you may be going through. As far as the presence of God, the spirit of God is there, it's just a matter of time. Can I have an amen? amen. It was, the earth was without form and void, shapeless. Someone's life this morning may appear shapeless. You may be wondering, what's happening to me? Darkness upon the face of the deep. Everywhere you turn to, everywhere looks dim. There appears to be no hope. But as long as Ruach Elohim is present, as long as the spirit of the living God is present, I want you to be assured, hallelujah. Can I have an amen? Yeah. All you need to know is remember what he has spoken to you. The next verse is, and God said. 
let there be light. And there was light. Wherever you find the Spirit of God, the Word of God must be present to activate your need. Can I have an amen? Spirit of God may be in a place, but it needs God to say. Hallelujah. In other words, you must remember a word that he has cooking in your heart. And when you speak forth that word, light will break forth. Amen. I don't know what situation you are in this morning, but I don't know. But you know. Hallelujah. Amen. I want you to know, I want you to release and exercise your faith now as you open your mouth and begin to say what you desire instead of that darkness. Lift up your voice in the name of Jesus. I don't know what your situation is, but speak the opposite of it. Yes, in darkness, God said, let there be light, and light showed up. I don't know whether it is hunger that is yours. Abundance is able to come your way. Speak abundance. Whether it is lack, if yours is lack, begin to pronounce abundance over your situation. If there is emotional torture, why don't you begin to speak emotional freedom? For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I am free in the spirit. I am free in the spirit. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Number two, we are going to take a prayer before we begin the word this morning. As the pastors were meeting, as we were praying this morning, in our meeting, God said to my heart, pray against spiritual thieves, that no one's virtue will be stolen. Do you know what that means? Hallelujah. That your star will not be stolen. That your virtue, the grace that you carry, the essence of God in your life will not be stolen. In the name of Jesus. Lift up your voice and pray for yourself. That the essence of God will not be stolen in your life. In the name of Jesus, that emotional thieves will not steal your joy. They will not steal your joy. The Bible says the devil comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That your joy will not be stolen. That your happiness will not be stolen. That your virtue will not be stolen. In the name of Jesus, that your peace will not be stolen. That the devil will not steal your peace. He will not steal your happiness. He will not steal your light in the name of Jesus. That your, your virtue will not be stolen. What is making you tick will not be stolen. That the enemy will never be able to cover your star. That the enemy will never be able to steal your star. In the name of Jesus. In the Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Your family is secured. Your destiny is secured. Your joy is secured. Your businesses are secured. Your careers are secured. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you are secured in Christ. In the name of Jesus. Let's put our hands together this morning. Please, you may be seated. God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Thank you, precious voices, for that powerful ministration. Ruach Elohim. Spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. This morning, by the grace of God, for the few minutes that are left... Precious voices took all the time. But a few minutes left this morning, we are continuing in our series on the principle of balance as we examine God's divine order. And this should be part five. Our text, we have been reading from Ecclesiastes chapter nine from verses seven to 10. Go eat your bread with joy. And drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already accepted your works. Hallelujah. May what you do find God's approval. 
in the name of Jesus. May the works of your hand be acceptable before God. Verse 8, let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun. Because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. And verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. I will not end up in Sheol. I say you will not end up in hell. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So we did say that God has a divine order for man. His principle of balance is predicated on three relationships, or man's relationship on three planes. The first one is your relationship with God, which verse number eight stands for, let your garment be always white and not, don't allow oil to be lacking on your head. And then verse nine talks about your relationship with your family or your spouse enjoy life with the wife whom you love. And then the third dimension is the relationship with your work, verse number 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Do it with your might. So that's God's divine order. It's relationship with you, your relationship with your God, your relationship with your family comes second, and then your relationship with your work. Hallelujah. And whenever there is a rearrangement of that order, there will be consequences, negative consequences. Hallelujah. In the last couple of two weeks, we've looked at the first one, the dimension of our relationship with God and what it means or what God's expectation is, you know, for us to have of our garments to remain white. We've looked at all of that. And this morning, by the grace of God, we are moving on to the second dimension of your relationship with your spouse. Verse number 9. Ecclesiastes 9.9. 9. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun. I would like us to start from the beginning because the beginning specifies without any form of corruption what God's original intent is. Hallelujah. You will recall that in the beginning, God made man in his own image and in his own likeness. He created man in his image and in his likeness in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. And when he formed man, he did something. We are told that he breathed life, his ruach, his spirit into man. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. He formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That is ruach, his ruach, his spirit. A man became what? A living creature. Then he went ahead, he put man in the garden. Verse 15 tells us he planted the garden and then he put man in the garden, the man that he had formed, to keep it and to till it. He took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to walk it and to keep it. Can I have an amen? So we saw his relationship with God in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 and now we are seeing work. He was establishing work. And as he tried to establish work, what happened? He then discovered that something is missing. Let's read verse 16. Glory to God. And he commanded the man, saying, You will surely eat of every tree of the garden. Control. Limitations. Verse 17. I'm going to eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Hallelujah. Let me tell your brother, your sister, your neighbor, there is always a limit. In every relationship, there are boundaries. Don't cross the boundary. Don't cross the line. Hallelujah. In your relationship with your boss, you must not cross the line. There are certain jokes and jestings you can do with your colleagues, but not with your boss. Can I have an amen? There is always a boundary. 
Your relationship with whoever, whatever relationship you have, your relationship with God, there is always a boundary. Don't take God for granted. Even your spouse, don't take your spouse for granted. Can I have an amen? So there is always a boundary. Then, look at verse 18. So God created man. He had a relationship with him. His breath, his spirit was living in him. Then verse 18. He took, he said, then in verse 15, he put man in the garden that he had formed. In the garden he had created for work. And then in verse 18. Amen. Don't worry about this. I mean, I don't want to be distracted. So please just leave me on. He said, it is not what good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Can we please just leave this thing as it is? Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Hallelujah. Amen. God says it's not good. Whatever God does is always good. Can I have an amen? Yeah. So when God begins to say something is not good, pay attention that that thing is not good. When God says it's not good that a man should be alone, please note that it's not good. How did he arrive at, its, at the fact that it's not good? <laughs> Glory to God. Okay, so God said it's not good. Listen to me, friends. God is always in the business, thank you, the business of self-assessment. God is always in the business of self-assessment, in the business of feedbacks to check what he has done so that if it's not good enough, he can make amends. Can I have an amen? In your job, when last did you carry out a self-assessment? In your business, when last did you say, let me review my performance? Have I been making profit or losses? In your relationship with your spouse, when last did the two of you sit down to examine how far you have come? You started well, everything was loving, doving, but recently, you're always antagonizing one another. Everything your wife says, you get angry. When other people talk, you smile. When other people's wives talk to you, you are like the angel. How? Well done, sir. Well done, ma. God bless you, ma. But when your wife talks, you squeeze your face. Uh -huh. Kilo de. Hallelujah. Have you sat down to evaluate how did you come this far? But God is always in the business of evaluation. Let me tell your neighbor, evaluate yourself. Let's go back quickly. I think I need to emphasize that. Genesis chapter 1. On each day of creation, God always sat back to check out what he has done. Genesis chapter 1. Let's quickly go back. Glory to God. Genesis 1 verse 3. Let's read from verse 3. On day 1, day 2, day 3. On each day, God always goes back to check what he did. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. He saw the light was good. So what happened? God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from darkness. And that was the one. He saw that the light was good. In other words, he examined it. Is this thing good or not? Is this okay? Will this thing be beneficial to humanity? That I want to be my regent here? And he saw that it was good. And he separated the light from darkness. Hallelujah. Go on quickly. Let's read on verse 5. He always did that each day. So God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Verse 6. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the expanse and separated the waters. There were, in other words, he created the sky. So he separated the waters above in the clouds and then that on the ground. So he created the sky. Hallelujah. So that they were above the expanse, and it was so. Verse 8, quickly. And God called the expanse heaven. This is not heaven, it is sky. Because he's in his heavens. Can I have an amen? And you know that there are many heavens. Can I have an amen? So this one is the sky. Called expanse. It's a space. Sky. 
And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place. So he called all the waters on the ground. So yeah, gather in one place. Land, come forth. And let the dry land appear. And it was so. So God called the dry land earth. And the waters that were gathered above, he called seas. And God saw that it was. So it's always seen. If you check out that place, the whole of Genesis chapter 1, there was no day that God did not sit back to evaluate what he has done. No day. Oh, I wish you would sit down every day to evaluate your performance. What did I do right today? What did I do wrong today? And make amends immediately. I remember a boss that I had many years ago of blessed memory. One of my partners. Each year, he will bring diaries. He says, you must learn to keep a diary. Learn to keep a diary. Say, what do you use it for? He said, every day, after you do your meditation or your prayers, whoever faith, whatever faith you belong to, he said, sit back and outline the things you want to do for the day. Write them down. And after you have written them down, you begin to, as you are going about the day, tick them the ones you have done. So you are not likely to have finished all the assignments for that day. So when you come back in the evening, sit back and evaluate the day. And see, oh, well, this meeting, how did it go? It went where? There's need for a follow-up. You take notes. You carry that over to the next day. Or if you have scheduled a meeting, you go and write it in your diary the day of the meeting you have scheduled. Can I have an amen? So God was, is in that business of constant evaluation. And when you do that, you will not miss things. Because many times you forget stuff. You forget this because you have not written them down. And then suddenly you remember, ah, I have a meeting. And then you start running helter-skelter. Can I have an amen? May you not miss out on your destiny in the name of Jesus. So God was in the business of constant evaluation, seeing that what he does is good. So after he created, formed man from the dust of the ground and he has breathed into him and established a relationship with him, he put man in the garden to till the ground, to walk it and to keep it. And then after evaluating it, he says, look, this is not good. It's not good that the man is alone. Jump to verse 18, Genesis 2. Hallelujah. I'm emphasizing this because I believe someone here, your albatross, your Achilles heel is lack of evaluation. You don't even know whether you are making profit in your business. You just keep going and going. Keep spending as they come. Whether you are making losses, you do not know. Whereas you have a great potential to achieve so much. But because of your lack of evaluation, you have limited yourself. Thus says the Spirit of the Lord. So he wants you to make amends. Glory to God. So the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Next verse. Please take note of that. A helper fit for him. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Then the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Please take note of that word. Fit, fit, fit. So what did God do? So God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up his place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man. Rib is at where? Where is the rib? Where is it? Side. Take note of that. I'll come back to that. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. He built into a woman and brought her to the man. That word made is the word to build. It's different from forming. Hallelujah. He formed man, but he took time to build the woman. Can I have an amen? Don't joke with women. If you do, you will soon die before your time. Hallelujah. That's a joke, but I mean it. It's an expensive joke. But don't joke with women. Glory to God. They have been fearfully and wonderfully made. Next verse, 23. Then the man said, This at last, Amen, is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And I always throw this poser. 
Let's talk English now. English. This at last. What does that mean? Finally. So, what was the expectation of God when he made those beasts and those animals and he brought them to the man? Whether he will find any of them that was a fit. Can I have an amen? Remember I told you to take note of the word fit. Fit. Many men have married beasts and not their best fit. Many women have married beasts and not their best fit. Do we not see men who have been who behave like beasts to their spouses? Do we not see women who behave like beasts to their spouses? It's because of a misfit that they carried. When you carry a misfit that is not a good fit, you may end up with a beast beside you. Hallelujah. Can I have an amen? It says, this at last, finally. And many times, if you don't wait for you at last, hey, be careful, you may end up with a beast. I'm not scaring you, but that's the reality. From the beginning, from the word of God. Shout hallelujah. Glory to God. Pastor is trying to scare us in this journey of marriage. It's enough to be scared because 50% of your life will have been mortgaged if you miss marriage. We normally, they normally read, ask us to read. It should not be taken unadvisedly. It's not something you jump into. Oh, I have some change in my pocket. I cannot carry a woman. Don't deceive yourself. Oh no, I'm old enough to have it. You can be old enough and still be a baby and know nothing and no jack. Hallelujah. Glory to God. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's consider a few thoughts out of this passage we have read. As we examine what God's plan is, what is this second dimension of his order, relationship with family. Number one, just like man was God's idea when he said in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, marriage was also his idea. Marriage was also his idea. <clears throat> marriage is not the idea of any man. You cannot wake up one day, God made you a man, and you say you want to have a man as a wife. It's an abomination. It's not your idea. You cannot tweak it to suit you. Say, oh, I'm feeling like a woman. Even though you're a man, I'm feeling. So, I want to have a husband and you're a man. You are a pervert. You are not normal. Something is wrong with you. Come to God. Come to Christ so that he can save you. It's not your idea. Marriage was not man's idea. It was God who said, it is not good that this man should be alone to carry out the assignment that I have for him. It was, it's not the idea of any man. So anybody say, I'm a lesbian, I'm a this, please come to Christ. Let him save you. Just as man was not, just as man was God's idea, let us make man in our image and our likeness. In the same manner, marriage was God's idea. It's not any man's idea. You cannot run it the way you like. There's a template for it. And anything contrary to that template is an abomination. Glory to God. Anything contrary to that template is an abomination. Today, members of parliament are afraid to say female, male. A developed nation like United Kingdom, you have members of parliament, ministers, elected representatives of the people. They ask them questions. They are dodging questions. They don't want to define who a female is. Hallelujah. And then you want to jump out to that country? Where are your values? If God is not sending you there, please don't go. When the state 
when you are operating in an environment that will miniscule your faith, they will soon miniscule your life. An environment that is squeezing your faith, where ministers cannot say what they believe. A Scottish member of parliament resigned. They recalled him. His, part, his, his constituents recalled him. He said, I will never compromise my faith. I know what my faith says about marriage. This is ungodly. They recalled him. He said, bye-bye to Rob. Bye-bye to Jati Jati. Take your mem- mem- parliamentship. Or whatever it is. Hallelujah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Please. Don't let your child, don't let your cousin, don't let your nephew, if they begin to say some funny things and begin to dress, you give back to him a male and he's dressing like a woman. I say, well, it's just, please bring him to Christ. Call them to order, go on your knees and pray for them. It cannot be one in the flesh. It's not by confrontation alone. It's not by doing braggadocio. I'm your father, I'm your mother. You can say that and inside it remains. John, stand up. Mom, I'm standing up outside, but inside I am sitting. Hallelujah. So you must go on your knees and beseech God for them. Because this is the spirit of the age. It's the spirit of the new age. Hallelujah. Can I have an amen? You must take this very seriously because it's ravaging the land. We see this superpower say we are not going to give you aid if you don't support LGBTQ community. Then let them hold on to their aid. Can I have an amen? I'd rather die hungry than to bow to the God of this world and the gospel they are propagating. But if we are not careful, hallelujah, none of you will fall a victim. None of your children will fall a victim. In the name of Jesus, your labors over there will never be in vain. In the mighty name of Jesus. God said it is not good. It is the idea of God and not the idea of any man. Marriage is the idea of God. It's not any man's idea. You can't run it by your own rules. You must follow the template of God. Glory to God. Number two. God intended marriage to provide the balance that man needs to function optimally at the assignment he has given to him. Because he gave, he put him in the garden to till it and to keep it. And then he said, it is not good that this man, let me find a helper comparable to him. A helper. This man, 100% is not adequate. He needs an helper. In other words, for him to function optimally, he needs a helper. Shout hallelujah. I don't care how brilliant you are, man. Thank God for your life. But God says it is not good that you should be alone. I will make a helper. Even if our contribution is 1%, your 100% is not good enough. Can I have an amen? Oh, you are so good, perfect in every area. You scored 99%. In the sight of God, God says it is not good. As long as you are alone. May you find your mate. I said, may you find your mate. May you find your mate. In the name of Jesus. And those of you yearning in your heart, when is my mate going to come? I'm here to announce a season, a season of fulfillment to you in the name of Jesus. In this season, what you have longed for, what you have waited for, they will begin to run after you. Your problem will be choice from this season in the name of Jesus. I will make him a helper fit. So God intended marriage to provide the balance that man needs to function optimally at the assignment he has given him. Number three, God intended the helper to be a fit one. Fit for him. A helper fit for him. He intended the helper to be a fit one. Those of you who are in human resources, you'll have heard of person job fit. How many of you have ever heard of that? Okay, if you're in human resource cycles, you're person job fit. You know, when you want to hire somebody, is it a good fit? You examine the career, some test to determine whether, look, we are looking for somebody with these characteristics. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Is the person an action person? 
or is just a collaborator, or is the person a thinker? It depends on what you need. If what you need in your business is a thinker to f formulate strategy, to develop strategy, and you go and put a tactical person there, look, there's what is called tactics and strategy. Hallelujah. Tactics is for everyday operations. It's an operational person. Do this, he will do it. Do this, he will do it. They cannot use their discretion. If what you need is somebody that will help you for policy, you need a thinker. And if you go and hire somebody who is an action person, go without thinking. And then you get to the middle of the road. <laughs> While I did, you will now begin to retrace your step back. Or you go and hire, or what you need is a collaborator who is able to collaborate. They cannot act on their own. Oh yeah, do this. I go and meet them, do this meeting. Hallelujah. That's why human results, they talk of person job fit. God intended that whoever you marry must be a helper that is fit for you. Not just anybody. What is good for the goose is not good for the gander. What is good for Sam or Tanaka is not good for John and for Labi. Can I have an amen? So you don't, the grass is always greener on the other side, but not as marriage is concerned. Whoever God has given you is your best fit. Can I have an amen? amen? If you are in need and you are wondering and you are not like sister so so and so, sister, she's so respectful. She's always greeting somebody. Can be greeting you in the public. <laughs> God bless you. God. And meanwhile, inside is a gagul. You get to me and say, who are you talking to? But outside, God bless you. God bless you. The center of gravity is so low. They can easily bend. God bless you. Meanwhile, inside, it's not like gagu. So yeah, you have, we, have, we are home now. Uh, what are you saying? Say, where's my food? Your food? Are you? Did we not just come back together? Eh? Can't you go? Can't you even make the food? Who even says that man cannot cook for a woman? Hallelujah. Meanwhile, in church, <laughs> God bless you. They have the brightest smiles. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for Jesus. So God intended the helper to be a fit one. One that is fit. A woman to man fit. Hallelujah. And ensuring a good fit, what did God do? God built the woman out of a rib by the side as an equal partner. He took a rib from the side. Beside. Can I, can I have an amen? Beside as an equal partner. And listen to what Matthew Henry said. Matthew Henry is a Bible commentator. He wrote Matthew Henry's Bible commentary. Hallelujah. Listen to what he said. The woman was made of a rib out of the side of, a, of Adam. Not made out of his head to rule over him nor out of his feet to be trampled upon. Can I have an amen? Your wife is not meant to be trampled upon. She was not made out of the rib or bones at the feet. No. Neither is she designed to rule over you because she was not taken from the head. But out of his side to be equal with him under his arm so that you, the man, can protect her and near his heart so that she can be beloved. Hallelujah. I concur with Matthew Henry totally. She was taken out of the rib from his side as an equal partner, not from his head to rule over him. A woman ought not to rule over a woman and she was not taken from the bones, from the feet to be trampled upon. No, but right from the side to be equal partner under his arms so that he can protect her Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm very close to his heart so that she can be beloved. I explained to you a couple of weeks back what it means to be beloved. To be beloved means to be loved before. It's unconditional love. Not because she has put food on your table. Not because she is the mother of your children. Not because, because she is your feet. Helper, you must love her. Not because of anything she has done. What did you do for Christ to save you? While we were yet sinners, Christ died. Romans chapter 5. He died for you and I. 
You didn't merit it. You are meant to hang on the gallows for the soul that sin shall die. But yet, in that state of you being a sinner, he sent his only begotten, his best. So to be beloved means to love before. He has loved you from the foundation of the world. When you find your help, your help mate, your feet, your, your, your feet, your helper that is fit for you, you have to beloved her. Beloved her. Hallelujah. She doesn't need to do anything to deserve your love. You didn't do anything to deserve the love of Christ. It was his mercy. It was his mercy. I say it was his mercy. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Okay. Number four. While God will assist the man in the making of the woman, he left the responsibility of choice to the man. God assisted, isn't it? He made beasts. He brought her. Adam did not find any. Made birds. Did not find any. Made this. He did not find any. Until he caused him to go on a deep sleep. Then he took the rib, a rib from his side, and closed back the flesh. And then from the rib that he had taken, God built something beautiful out. And then he presented the man to the woman. The woman to the man. From the man he made into a woman, he brought her to the man. He said, this at last, finally, even though God helped you to locate, he can bring before you, bring different choices before you. The responsibility of choice is left to who? You must be the one to make the choice. Hallelujah. And when you come to pastor, hey, you know, pastor, is it the will of God? What is God saying? I will ask you. Because I will not be responsible for your choice. Me, me the first show, pastor, those don't force me. Oh, pastor, I will not talk me into it. Oh. No, not me. Hallelujah. No, it's your choice. So is it the, are you sure? Have you prayed? <laughs> I've prayed. <laughs> I think Badura. Show me. Hallelujah. God helped the man, but the responsibility of choice he left for Adam. Can I have an amen? We are talking about the fundamentals. You will be responsible for your choice. You have gone quiet on me now. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Number five. God then set up the guidelines and code of conduct for the new institution called marriage. Verses 24 and 25. After he helped the man to find, to locate, and left the choice. In verse 23, the man said, this at last is born of my bones. Who did the naming ceremony of the woman? Who did the naming ceremony? Who did? Is it God or Adam? She shall be called. You hear all manners of things, darling. You hear honey. You hear sweetheart. It's you. You, you be the one to call. And when the sweetheart is no longer sweet, you carry your, you carry your cross. Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? All those adjectives, babe. A grown up, I say that, babe. Hey, what with the babe? I say, but babe, what to the baby? Hey, what is the baby? Glory to God. So, Adam did the naming ceremony. And after the naming ceremony of his wife was done, what happened? Look at verse 24. God set up the guidelines and codes of conduct. Number one. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. The code, number one. Let's look at the guidelines and codes of conduct. Number one. Man must leave behind all his baggage from where he's coming from. Must leave behind. It says, man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast. In other words, you must depart freely from the old covenant. There must be sometimes a physical break from your parents, the cord of your parents. There must be a social separation and there must be a spiritual separation. Can I have an amen? Physical, social, spiritual. It says, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast. Hallelujah. In other words, there must be an establishment of a new institution, a new covenanted family. That's what it means. You must leave. There must be a leaving. There must be a separation. Can I have an amen? Glory to God. Number two, 
the man must hold fast to his wife. In other words, this depicts essential unity. In other words, the man must be the anchor for the wife. He must hold fast to her. He must be the anchor, the support. This new institution, please take note, is now superior to the one you have left behind. It is what? It is superior to the one you have left behind. The one you left behind is now subordinate to it. When you pluck a mango from a mango tree, the tree is already established, right? So divine, your parents, you are the branches, isn't it? And then when it's time for you to go, you go, take you as a branch or a seed. Can I have an amen? You now go and plant your own family. When you plant that new mango tree, right? It grows to become a tree of its own. Can I have an amen? Even though the seed was taken from that other mango tree, but you are now an individual tree by yourself. Can I have an amen? It's a new institution. Totally new. And it's superior to where you are coming from. So your family must not be subordinated to your family where you're coming from. Don't subordinate your family to your parents. Don't subordinate your family to your siblings. Don't! Or else you'll be out of order. You'll be out of the balance of God. Shout hallelujah. Can I have an amen? Yeah. You must hold fast to your wife. Number three, they shall become one flesh. We are looking at the guidelines and codes of conduct. They shall become one flesh. What does it mean? They must begin to operate as one. This depicts a higher wholeness of man in man and his wife. I told you before, you may be 99.9% that 0.001% in the sight of God disqualifies you from being good. So you must now begin to operate as one. That's the plan and the purpose of God. Hallelujah. They shall become one flesh. Again, that talks about the indissolubility, the original indissolubility plan of God for marriage. Number four, they were both naked. What does this mean? This talks of transparency with one another. It talks of transparency with one another. It's also an expression of perfect innocence. They were both naked. These guys were innocent. Glory to God. They were innocent. And number five, they were not ashamed. This depicts full disclosure. They were both naked and they were not ashamed. There was no embarrassment with one another. No embarrassment. Full disclosure. Transparency. If you marry somebody and you're not confident of sharing certain deep truths with the person, you already have a problem. Hello? Say, you know, this is men's stuff. You cannot share it with a woman. But you can discuss it with your brother. You're already operating in error not according to the guidelines and codes of conduct. I know African man, we don't want to hear that. I'm not an African man, I'm a Jesus man. Can I have an amen? Yes. And he said, you know, there are certain things you don't tell your spouse. You didn't marry right. You didn't. Hallelujah. Let me balance the equation. The woman must recognize her role and responsibility. Not the woman that is always chacha chu chu chu. He has best friends. Bestie. They call him bestie. He has my bestie. Even the way he slept, the style he used, the style the husband used to sleep with her, he will share with bestie. You are a fool. Can I have an amen? I'm trying to create balance because that's the excuse some men give that my wife talks too much. She has too many friends. There she's controlled. Then the two of you, something is wrong with you. You need come for counseling. Can I have an amen? I'm trying to create a balance. We're talking of God's guidelines and code of conduct for the new institution he just instituted. It's his idea. It says they were both naked and were not ashamed. There's transparency. There's full disclosure between them. Hallelujah. There's no bestie between... Was there a bestie there? Is there a bestie there? I say, my bestie, what they cannot tell the husband, their bestie knows. 
And the man also has his paddy, paddy man. What they cannot share with his wife. He, share, he knows his friends that they drink together and they lounge. He shares with them. Dysfunctions. Hallelujah. Dysfunctionalities. As God grants us grace, we'll look at variants to that order. When that order is not followed, I will share with you some variants if God permits. Shout hallelujah. A man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Number six, we did say, as I concur with Matthew Henry, that God took the bone, the reed from near his heart so that she can be beloved. I already talked about that, but take note, it's one of the code of conduct. You must beloved your spouse. You must love her without conditions. Not because of what she does or does not do. And number seven, under his arm, you must provide protection for your spouse. It's your duty as the man to protect your wife. Whether she's right or wrong, it's your duty to protect her. Can I have an amen? amen. Under your arms, you must provide protection. You must take responsibility for her. Guidelines and codes of conduct. Shout hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. As we conclude this morning, let me put in summary. We can confidently say that a healthy marriage is a sign of obedience to God. It's a sign of obedience to God. God says it's not good for that man should be alone. So when you see a man who wants to prepare to go and have a healthy marriage, it's a sign of obedience to God. Number two, a family is a building block for culture. It's a building block of culture. The family mountain is a building block for culture. Is the supply of raw materials to all the other six mountains of culture. What are the other mountains? Education, media, celebration. What else? Politics and government. And then business. And which other one? Religion. Hallelujah. Who supplies the raw materials? Can any of those functions, any of those mountains function without people? The family is the bedrock of the society. And that's why we must get it right. When the family is dysfunctional, we are laying seeds for the future dysfunctionality of the society. And number three, reason why a healthy marriage is important. A healthy marriage is a beautiful and accurate portrait of the relationship between Christ and his church. Ephesians 5, 22 to 23. Ephesians 5, 22 down to 33. Let's read as, as we close this morning. Ephesians chapter 2. 5 verse 22. We'll read quickly as we round up this morning. Ephesians chapter 5 verse number 22. A healthy marriage is a beautiful and accurate portrait of the relationship between Christ and his church. Wives, submit to your own husbands. As to next verse, we are going to 33 quickly. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands don't like that, but listen to this. If you love that, yes, husbands love that, that wives should submit in everything to their husbands. But look at the next catch. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church, and gave himself up for her. God expects you to be able to give your life for your wife. If you are ready to give your life for your wife, just as Christ loved the church and went to the cross for her, then she will submit to you in everything. The equation is always balanced with God. God is not man. He doesn't make a mistake. Stop quoting and harassing your wife that uh, she's not submitting in this area. Can you die for her? Or when armed robbers come to your house, you go and lock yourself up in the toilet. Hallelujah. So you should go and present yourself. Yes, I'm the owner of this house. And I'm the head of this house. If they want to chop your head, let them chop it. Glory to God. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. You will never be a victim. You'll never be a victim of robbers. You'll never be a victim of hired assassins. In the name of Jesus. Your life is hid in Christ and Christ in God. 
Your family is protected under the everlasting arms of God. In the name of Jesus. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Let's quickly read on. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. If your wife is not meeting up to your expectation, who is to work on her? You, is your job. You have the creative capacity. You have been made in the image and the likeness of God. Work on her. Wash her with the washing of water by the word. Use the word of God to coach her, to train her, to counsel her, to mentor her to whom you want her to be. Stop complaining and look at other people's wives. Stop comparing her to other people's wives. They that compare themselves with themselves are not wise. She's the best fit for you, but she needs you to work on her. Hallelujah. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And that's why the Yoruba says, um, um, when you don't take, say, soap, go become, how did he take all that thing? <laughs> Tell me. Be? Be way back, be la ra With time, when you have been together for a while, in the beginning, there will be roughness. She's coming from a different background. You are coming. But as you grow, as you mentor one another, as you coach one another, you will know what your wife will do. You will know what your husband will do. How many of you know that? Because that's God's plan. That she might be holy and without blemish. Initially, she may not be so. We have been taught everything is in seed form. Right? And uh, she's giving you as a seed. God knows this is the seed that is the best fit for you. Work on her so that she can bring forth fruits a hundredfold that will benefit your life. It's for you to cultivate the seed. Let's read the next few verses as we close this morning. Hallelujah. Verse 28. In the same way, husbands, you what? Love their wives as their own. Stop complaining. If your wife is on the fat side, she's you. So stop complaining. Love her. Be loved. You should love her before. What were you looking at? She grew to that state. And when she got to that state, what are you doing to help her to come down? Stop complaining. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If she's like that, it's because you have failed. I know you don't like to hear that, but that's the truth. Love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but does what? nourishes and cherishes it. Say nice words. I love your robust style. In fact, that's the one I love in this season. We just have to work on it so that you can become more lepacious. Hallelujah. Not you are too fat. I've told you. I've told you. Look, look. You, I will look outside. Oh. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look outside now. Uh, glory to God. No one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Next verse, we're going to 33. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become, somebody says, Old Testament. See it here, Ephesians. Because they are the guidelines and codes of conduct for a healthy marriage. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she, love comes before respect. In the beginning, he put res, submit, eh? submit, and then you love. But when you love, your respect will be like this. Your respect will know no bounds. You're coming, hey, pastor, you see, my wife doesn't respect me. Do you love her? Are you ready to give your life for her? Do you demonstrate it not by words of mouth? In action! You do it in action? How many of you know that when you are behaving yourself and you are being a good husband, if I, the greeting will be different. How many of you know when you put money at the right time, before they ask, you have already put money. Before they need something, you have bought it. The way they will treat you like a king. But when they have to come and beg and kneel down before you provide one cobble, where is the respect? You say your husband is not respected. How will he respect you? Why well, you are not behaving yourself? Are you man enough? 
Hallelujah. Let's rise up on our feet this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we are grateful to you. Blessed be your holy name. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.